This is the Cambridge Assessment International Education, Cambridge IGCSE, 9 to 1, June 2019 examination in English as a Second Language. Paper 4. Listening. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the exam. Exercise 1 You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words or a number for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1 A which is the woman's favourite picture? B. Who is the man going to send the postcard to? This is the best selection of postcards we've seen so far. There are some great pictures of the island. Yes. Look at this one. The volcano. Isn't that where we're going tomorrow? Oh, I hadn't spotted that. Here, I've got the castle we visited and another of the beach we can see from the hotel. But I like yours most of all. Who are you going to send it to? Just thinking. I could send one to my brother. I'll be seeing him again before it arrives, though. I think my sister will like getting this one. Good choice. I'll get one, too, for my nephew. This is the best selection of postcards we've seen so far. There are some great pictures of the island. Yes. Look at this one. The volcano. Isn't that where we're going tomorrow? Oh, I hadn't spotted that. Here, I've got the castle we visited and another of the beach we can see from the hotel. But I like yours most of all. Who are you going to send it to? Just thinking. I could send one to my brother. I'll be seeing him again before it arrives, though. I think my sister will like getting this one. Good choice. I'll get one, too, for my nephew. Question 2. A. Where will the college party take place? B. How much will each ticket cost? Hi, John. Thanks for doing the first draft of the poster for the end-of-term party. It looks great. I just noticed a couple of things to change. I know the canteen wasn't our first choice for the venue, but that's what we've got, because I've just heard that the main hall is being redecorated that weekend. Actually, I'm sure it'll be big enough. And could you change the price per person, too? We can get it down from £5.50 to £4.20, because the band we've booked is going to play for free. Everything else looks great. Thanks again, and see you at college tomorrow. Hi, John. Thanks for doing the first draft of the poster for the end-of-term party. It looks great. I just noticed a couple of things to change. I know the canteen wasn't our first choice for the venue, but that's what we've got, because I've just heard that the main hall is being redecorated that weekend. Actually, I'm sure it'll be big enough. And could you change the price per person, too? We can get it down from £5.50 to £4.20, because the band we've booked is going to play for free. Everything else looks great. Thanks again, and see you at college tomorrow. Question 3. A. Which talk do the students decide to go to? B. What is the girl going to do next? I'm so glad we decided to come to this conference. The talks all sound really interesting, especially the financial planning one.
I wanted to go to that talk. It's already full, though. So how about managing change? What do you think? Excellent. Oh, and have you heard if you've got any work in the summer yet? They said they'd let us know today. I think I'll phone the office. Oh, hang on. I'll check my email before I do that. It won't take a minute. OK. I'm so glad we decided to come to this conference. The talks all sound really interesting, especially the financial planning one. I wanted to go to that talk. It's already full, though. So how about managing change? What do you think? Excellent. Oh, and have you heard if you've got any work in the summer yet? They said they'd let us know today. I think I'll phone the office. Oh, hang on. I'll check my email before I do that. It won't take a minute. OK. Question 4. A. What does the author need to decide before she starts writing a new book? B. Where does the author prefer to write? Coming up after the news is The Book Show, and today's interview is with the novelist Mina Rial. She's written nine best-selling novels so far, and says she'll soon start on her tenth, but not until she's got a title that she's happy with. Interestingly, the plot isn't the first thing that she comes up with. She says that she writes by hand in her garden if it's not too cold. Although she has a fantastic office with an enormous desk, she feels that she's less creative when she works there. Listen to her interview for more details and a few surprises too, coming up after the news. Coming up after the news is The Book Show, and today's interview is with the novelist Mina Rial. She's written nine best-selling novels so far, and says she'll soon start on her tenth, but not until she's got a title that she's happy with. Interestingly, the plot isn't the first thing that she comes up with. She says that she writes by hand in her garden if it's not too cold. Although she has a fantastic office with an enormous desk, she feels that she's less creative when she works there. Listen to her interview for more details and a few surprises, too, coming up after the news. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment, you will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 2. You will hear a teacher giving a talk about an exhibition on Australian history. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. I'd like to start today's lesson with some information about an exhibition that's on at the National Museum at the moment. We've been studying Australian history all this term, and this exhibition is very relevant. It runs through to the last week in August, but the school has arranged a trip on the 30th of June. I'll hand out more information later. So, the exhibition is about the history of the Aboriginal people. They have lived in Australia for thousands of years, well before Europeans arrived on the continent. The exhibition presents the history of these people in Australia through the objects they used. Many of these objects tell us about the relationship between the people and the land they lived on. For example, knowing where to find water was critical for survival. They used large leaves to make containers to carry water in, and in the exhibition you'll see an interesting example, which actually looks as if it's made of old leather. There's also a range of wooden tools that you'll see. These include weapons for hunting animals, generally used by men, and sticks, which women used when they were farming. Other objects in the exhibition indicate the importance of trade. You'll see examples of bags, which would have been filled with goods for trading with other people. The earliest examples of these bags were handmade from plant fibres and human hair. Later on, wool was used instead. On the coast of Australia, Aboriginal people exchanged goods with Indonesian fishermen who visited each year to gather sea cucumbers, 
which are still exported and sold in many Asian countries today. Further from the sea, goods such as tobacco and shells were sold, with stone being the most common item of trade. As you'd expect, there are also some wonderful Aboriginal drawings on display. Rock art, which is usually drawings of birds and animals found inside caves, obviously can't be removed. But the same style of drawing is now done on tree bark. You'll be able to see some examples of this, including one of a fish. It's described as X-ray art, as the bones inside the fish are visible. It's well worth taking a look at this part of the exhibition in particular. You'll also be able to see a more contemporary form of art. In the 1970s, a group of Aboriginal artists started to produce paintings which represent sculptures made out of sand. These have been created for many thousands of years. Of course, these can't be transported to an exhibition, but the paintings can. A section of one particular painting that you'll see at the exhibition actually features on the Australian passport, although the visa doesn't carry such an image. So it is very familiar to many Australians. OK, so here's the information about the exhibition which you can read at home, and I'd encourage you to sign up for the trip if you're interested. Now you will hear the talk again. I'd like to start today's lesson with some information about an exhibition that's on at the National Museum at the moment. We've been studying Australian history all this term, and this exhibition is very relevant. It runs through to the last week in August, but the school has arranged a trip on the 30th of June. I'll hand out more information later. So, the exhibition is about the history of the Aboriginal people. They have lived in Australia for thousands of years, well before Europeans arrived on the continent. The exhibition presents the history of these people in Australia through the objects they used. Many of these objects tell us about the relationship between the people and the land they lived on. For example, knowing where to find water was critical for survival. They used large leaves to make containers to carry water in, and in the exhibition you'll see an interesting example which actually looks as if it's made of old leather. There's also a range of wooden tools that you'll see. These include weapons for hunting animals, generally used by men, and sticks, which women used when they were farming. Other objects in the exhibition indicate the importance of trade. You'll see examples of bags, which would have been filled with goods for trading with other people. The earliest examples of these bags were handmade from plant fibres and human hair. Later on, wool was used instead. On the coast of Australia, Aboriginal people exchanged goods with Indonesian fishermen who visited each year to gather sea cucumbers, which are still exported and sold in many Asian countries today. Further from the sea, goods such as tobacco and shells were sold with stone being the most common item of trade. As you'd expect, there are also some wonderful Aboriginal drawings on display. Rock art, which is usually drawings of birds and animals found inside caves, obviously can't be removed. But the same style of drawing is now done on tree bark. You'll be able to see some examples of this, including one of a fish. It's described as X-ray art, as the bones inside the fish are visible. It's well worth taking a look at this part of the exhibition in particular. You'll also be able to see a more contemporary form of art. In the 1970s, a group of Aboriginal artists started to produce paintings which represent sculptures made out of sand. These have been created for many thousands of years. Of course, these can't be transported to an exhibition, but the paintings can. A section of one particular painting that you'll see at the exhibition actually features on the Australian passport, although the visa doesn't carry such an image.
so it is very familiar to many Australians. OK, so here's the information about the exhibition which you can read at home, and I'd encourage you to sign up for the trip if you're interested. That is the end of the talk. In a moment you will hear exercise 3. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You will hear six people talking about making decisions. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list A to G which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1 The biggest decision I had to make was where to go to university. There were two places I really liked the sound of, one near home and the other one much further away. I was really struggling to make up my mind right up until the deadline when I had to send in my application form. What helped me, though, was putting all my thoughts down on paper, such as not wanting to be too far from my best friend. Then I could finally see what was right for me. Speaker 2 I wanted to get a special present for my sister's 18th birthday last month. I thought some jewellery would be nice. I went shopping, and straight away I saw two things which I really liked. A really pretty bracelet and a silver necklace, just the sort of thing she'd wear. The shop assistant said the bracelet was extremely popular. My sister would appreciate it. That actually made me go for the necklace. However, when I got home, I had some doubts, until I gave it to my sister, who loved it. Speaker 3 Before my first ever job interview, I was really nervous and wasn't sure what to wear. The job was at a theatre, so I didn't want to appear too businesslike, in case that gave the wrong impression. Luckily, we had a special session on jobs at school. We had to come in wearing interview clothes and practice what we'd say. My teacher approved of my outfit, so I felt confident. Nearly everyone else was wearing smart suits, but I didn't let that affect my decision. Speaker 4 Last year, we had to do two weeks of work experience during the summer term. I applied to two places. The one which I wasn't so keen on replied straight away and offered me some work. I knew I needed to respond quickly, but I really wanted to hear from the other place too. Anyway, I waited as long as I dared and was about to turn down their offer when I realised that I'd still be learning the same skills wherever I was. So in the end, I accepted. And it was great. Speaker 5 Before I started university, I had a long summer break, and I didn't know whether to get a job, do some voluntary work, travel, or all three. Then one of my friends said he was going to do a water sports course for a few weeks. And after I'd thought about it for a while, it just seemed the right thing to do. My dad didn't think I'd made the right decision and kept trying to persuade me to earn some money instead, but I'm glad I didn't. Speaker 6 
My brother and I wanted to arrange something special for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. He came up with a list of ideas, including a party at home, a day trip to the seaside and a meal at a nice restaurant. We chatted about all of them, but I didn't need any persuading to go for the last one, as it stood out as the best option. He agreed, but only after he'd weighed up the advantages of each option and considered everything really carefully. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 The biggest decision I had to make was where to go to university. There were two places I really liked the sound of, one near home and the other one much further away. I was really struggling to make up my mind, right up until the deadline when I had to send in my application form. What helped me, though, was putting all my thoughts down on paper, such as not wanting to be too far from my best friend, then I could finally see what was right for me. Speaker 2 I wanted to get a special present for my sister's 18th birthday last month. I thought some jewellery would be nice. I went shopping and straight away I saw two things which I really liked a really pretty bracelet and a silver necklace, just the sort of thing she'd wear. The shop assistant said the bracelet was extremely popular. My sister would appreciate it. That actually made me go for the necklace. However, when I got home, I had some doubts, until I gave it to my sister, who loved it. Speaker 3 Before my first ever job interview, I was really nervous and wasn't sure what to wear. The job was at a theatre, so I didn't want to appear too businesslike, in case that gave the wrong impression. Luckily, we had a special session on jobs at school. We had to come in wearing interview clothes and practice what we'd say. My teacher approved of my outfit, so I felt confident. Nearly everyone else was wearing smart suits, but I didn't let that affect my decision. Speaker 4 Last year, we had to do two weeks of work experience during the summer term. I applied to two places. The one which I wasn't so keen on replied straight away and offered me some work. I knew I needed to respond quickly, but I really wanted to hear from the other place too. Anyway, I waited as long as I dared and was about to turn down their offer when I realised that I'd still be learning the same skills wherever I was. So in the end, I accepted. And it was great. Speaker 5 Before I started university, I had a long summer break and I didn't know whether to get a job, do some voluntary work, travel or all three. Then one of my friends said he was going to do a water sports course for a few weeks. And after I'd thought about it for a while, it just seemed the right thing to do. My dad didn't think I'd made the right decision and kept trying to persuade me to earn some money instead. But I'm glad I didn't. Speaker 6 My brother and I wanted to arrange something special for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. He came up with a list of ideas, including a party at home, a day trip to the seaside and a meal at a nice restaurant. We chatted about all of them, but I didn't need any persuading to go for the last one, as it stood out as the best option. He agreed, but only after he'd weighed up the advantages of each option and considered everything really carefully.
That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment, you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 4. You will hear a radio presenter talking to a student called Josie who helps to produce a school newspaper. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Here in the studio with me is Josie from Redwood School. Not only in her last year at secondary school, but also the editor of her school newspaper. Welcome, Josie. Thanks. Let's start by clarifying what being editor actually means. Well, it's not like a real newspaper where the editor's in charge of everything. We work as a team, so we have group meetings to decide what to write about and who's going to write what. Each person's also responsible for getting photos for their own stories. Everything gets sent to me and I work out what goes where, so what the actual pages will look like. Is producing the newspaper a lot of work? Not so much now, but it was when we started. First, we had to persuade the head teacher to let us do it. He agreed, but said we had to have a member of staff to make sure everything ran smoothly. I'm sure he thought it'd be straightforward to identify someone, though it was exactly the opposite. There was only one tiny room available on one day. We also had to get permission to use the school computers and printers. It all took time, but we got there. How do you pay for things like paper and printing costs? Well, it was made quite clear from the start that money from the school wasn't an option. We found out about a college for journalists which gave grants to school projects like ours. We applied and got one. We also considered adverts and getting money from them. That's what a lot of school and college newspapers rely on, though we wanted to be different in that respect. Do students have to pay for the newspaper as well? Yes, but it's really cheap, so that doesn't cover our costs. But we try to make sure that lots of students read it. How do you do that? Well, we have lots of puzzles, games and so on, things that readers really get involved with. And we also try to think of interesting articles with titles that grab the reader's attention to make them want to find out more. But there's nothing quite as effective as mentioning students by name in the articles, and perhaps in photos too. You mentioned interesting articles. What do you write about? All sorts. Things that are going on at school, like sports competitions, presentations, clubs. Also, we sometimes focus on individuals. For example, if they've achieved something or done something unusual. That's what I go for if I have the choice. And we write about things happening in the area as well, which can be interesting. <laughs> I'll make sure I read the next edition. Great. So, what made you want to start up the newspaper in the first place? I've always been interested in journalism. But actually, it was more the fact that a group of us were getting together after school, hanging around and not really doing anything. We just thought it'd be fun to do something more productive. And we all enjoy reading and writing too. And um, would you say you've benefited from the experience? Oh, definitely. I've learned loads. How to cooperate effectively as a group. That's probably the main thing. I've also learned how to get the best out of everyone. And what it's like to be in charge, to meet deadlines, things like that. When you leave school at the end of the year, do you know who'll take over? That's not my decision. We considered choosing someone ourselves, probably someone who's already involved. The head was in favour of that. Then we came up with the idea of asking anyone in the school who's interested to write a short statement about themselves. You know, why they'd be good as editor. We'll publish all of them in the paper, then take a school vote. It'll be a lot of work, but who knows who might end up taking over. I hope it's someone as good as you've been. And thanks for talking to us today. Thanks.
Now you will hear the interview again. Here in the studio with me is Josie from Redwood School. Not only in her last year at secondary school, but also the editor of her school newspaper. Welcome, Josie. Thanks. Let's start by clarifying what being editor actually means. Well, it's not like a real newspaper where the editor's in charge of everything. We work as a team, so we have group meetings to decide what to write about and who's going to write what. Each person's also responsible for getting photos for their own stories. Everything gets sent to me, and I work out what goes where. So what the actual pages will look like. Is producing the newspaper a lot of work? Not so much now, but it was when we started. First, we had to persuade the head teacher to let us do it. He agreed, but said we had to have a member of staff to make sure everything ran smoothly. I'm sure he thought it'd be straightforward to identify someone, though it was exactly the opposite. There was only one tiny room available on one day. We also had to get permission to use the school computers and printers. It all took time, but we got there. How do you pay for things like paper and printing costs? Well, it was made quite clear from the start that money from the school wasn't an option. We found out about a college for journalists which gave grants to school projects like ours. We applied and got one. We also considered adverts and getting money from them. That's what a lot of school and college newspapers rely on. Though we wanted to be different in that respect. Do students have to pay for the newspaper as well? Yes, but it's really cheap, so that doesn't cover our costs. But we try to make sure that lots of students read it. How do you do that? Well, we have lots of puzzles, games, and so on, things that readers really get involved with. And we also try to think of interesting articles with titles that grab the reader's attention to make them want to find out more. But there's nothing quite as effective as mentioning students by name in the articles, and perhaps in photos too. You mentioned interesting articles. What do you write about? All sorts. Things that are going on at school, like sports competitions, presentations, clubs. Also, we sometimes focus on individuals. For example, if they've achieved something or done something unusual. That's what I go for if I have the choice. And we write about things happening in the area as well, which can be interesting. <laughs> I'll make sure I read the next edition. Great. So, what made you want to start up the newspaper in the first place? I've always been interested in journalism, but actually it was more the fact that a group of us were getting together after school, hanging around and not really doing anything. We just thought it'd be fun to do something more productive, and we all enjoy reading and writing too. And、um, would you say you've benefited from the experience? Oh, definitely. I've learned loads. How to cooperate effectively as a group. That's probably the main thing. I've also learned how to get the best out of everyone, and what it's like to be in charge, to meet deadlines, things like that. When you leave school at the end of the year, do you know who'll take over? That's not my decision. We considered choosing someone ourselves, probably someone who's already involved. The head was in favour of that. Then we came up with the idea of asking anyone in the school who's interested to write a short statement about themselves. You know why they'd be good as editor. We'll publish all of them in the paper, then take a school vote. It'll be a lot of work, but who knows who might end up taking over? I hope it's someone as good as you've been. And thanks for talking to us today. Thanks. That is the end of the interview. In a moment, you will hear exercise five. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise five, part A. You will hear a psychology tutor giving a talk about studying the way children play. Listen to the talk 
and complete the notes in part A. Write one word only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Hello, everyone. In the last few lessons, we've talked about various theories to do with child development, the way children learn, and what affects their learning. Today, we'll look into how children play. It sounds like fun, but is actually a serious topic for study. In fact, just this year, a team of psychologists and scientists have set up a research centre here at the university to find out much more about play. Of course, we are all aware of the fact that plenty of play helps children to grow up to become imaginative, smarter, better adjusted adults. Only someone lacking in common sense would disagree with that. What is needed is a series of studies to provide the evidence which backs up what we all believe. There isn't much funding available, but the centre has managed to start work with a small team of four researchers and hopes to expand the team in the future if possible. Firstly, the team plans to extend studies which have been carried out so far. For example, research has shown that focusing on reading skills too early and also requiring children to do excessive amounts of homework can set them back in terms of development, especially if either of these factors means the children don't have enough time to play. Another aspect of interest is the actual classes themselves. Their level of structure is thought to influence how children develop. The length of classes doesn't seem to be an issue, as long as there is plenty of opportunity within the lesson for free, uncontrolled activity, in other words, play. Playing outside, for example, during break times is also of interest. Studies have shown that there are far more arguments if children play in an empty playground, if there's just bare concrete, for example. But if there are objects available that can be played with in a variety of ways, this effect is reduced. Being able to study play in a scientific way presents many challenges. The team will primarily use observation of children playing in the lab and also outside. This will provide them with data which can then be analysed scientifically to find out about the circumstances, how often events occur and so on. They will use software which will give accurate measures of frequency and also will identify repeated patterns of behaviour. Before we move on, are there any questions? Now you will hear the talk again. Hello, everyone. In the last few lessons, we've talked about various theories to do with child development, the way children learn and what affects their learning. Today, we'll look into how children play. It sounds like fun, but is actually a serious topic for study. In fact, just this year, a team of psychologists and scientists have set up a research centre here at the university to find out much more about play. Of course, we are all aware of the fact that plenty of play helps children to grow up to become imaginative, smarter, better adjusted adults. Only someone lacking in common sense would disagree with that. What is needed is a series of studies to provide the evidence which backs up what we all believe. There isn't much funding available but the centre has managed to start work with a small team of four researchers and hopes to expand the team in the future if possible. Firstly, the team plans to extend studies which have been carried out so far. For example, research has shown that focusing on reading skills too early and also requiring children to do excessive amounts of homework can set them back in terms of development especially if either of these factors means the children don't have enough time to play. Another aspect of interest is the actual classes themselves. Their level of structure is thought to influence how children develop. The length of classes doesn't seem to be an issue, 
as long as there is plenty of opportunity within the lesson for free, uncontrolled activity, in other words, play. Playing outside, for example, during break times is also of interest. Studies have shown that there are far more arguments if children play in an empty playground, if there's just bare concrete, for example. But if there are objects available that can be played with in a variety of ways, this effect is reduced. Being able to study play in a scientific way presents many challenges. The team will primarily use observation of children playing in the lab and also outside. This will provide them with data which can then be analysed scientifically to find out about the circumstances, how often events occur and so on. They will use software which will give accurate measures of frequency and also will identify repeated patterns of behaviour. Before we move on, are there any questions? Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about their psychology project on child development and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one word only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. Hi, Marta. Can we talk about our psychology project? Sure. I'm looking at my notes now. I read about Piaget, the Swiss psychologist, who studied cognitive development in children. That's the way children start to understand the world around them and think about things. Yeah, Piaget reckoned there are four stages in children's development. Mm. So the first stage is from birth to about two years of age. There's an experiment you can do. You put an object like a toy in front of a baby. Then when you hide it with something like a large piece of paper, the baby acts as if the object doesn't exist. They don't start to realise that the toy or whatever you're using is permanent until they're about a year old. Mm, and during this stage, they also start to discover what the consequences of their actions will be. So if they reach their hand out, they'll be able to take hold of something, for example. Or if they shake a bunch of keys, it'll make a noise. So their behaviour shows they are acting with intention. They want to grab things or get something to make a noise. Then the second stage is when they start to recognise certain features of objects. So they'll group red blocks together or they'll be able to say that two balls of clay are the same size. Yes, but then if you rolled one of those balls into a long, thin shape, the child would say it contains more clay. It takes a few years for the child to realise that the amount of clay is actually the same in both. And that idea is known as conservation, when they realise that the amount hasn't changed. Yes, or another measurement, such as weight. But that doesn't start to happen until the third stage. Ah, and then the fourth stage, that's from about 12 years of age, I think, that's when children begin to use logic, and when they can cope with things that are quite abstract too, like how long something will take to happen. It's interesting, isn't it? But I read that not all psychologists agree with this four-stage theory. There's another argument that children simply perform better in psychological tests as their language and memory improve. So it could just be that the capacity of their memory has got bigger. Mm, I'd like to find out more about that. But anyway, we've got plenty to write about, haven't we? Yes. Now you will hear the conversation again. Hi, Marta. Can we talk about our psychology project? Sure. I'm looking at my notes now. I read about Piaget, the Swiss psychologist who studied cognitive development in children. That's the way children start to understand the world around them and think about things. Yeah. Piaget reckoned there are four stages in children's development. Mm. So the first stage is from birth to about two years of age. 
There's an experiment you can do. You put an object like a toy in front of a baby. Then when you hide it with something like a large piece of paper, the baby acts as if the object doesn't exist. They don't start to realise that the toy or whatever you're using is permanent until they're about a year old.、Mm, and during this stage, they also start to discover what the consequences of their actions will be. So if they reach their hand out, they'll be able to take hold of something, for example. Or if they shake a bunch of keys, it'll make a noise. So their behaviour shows they are acting with intention. They want to grab things or get something to make a noise. Then the second stage is when they start to recognise certain features of objects. So they'll group red blocks together, or they'll be able to say that two balls of clay are the same size. Yes, but then if you rolled one of those balls into a long, thin shape, the child would say it contains more clay. It takes a few years for the child to realise that the amount of clay is actually the same in both. And that idea is known as conservation when they realise that the amount hasn't changed. Yes, or another measurement such as weight, but that doesn't start to happen until the third stage. Ah, and then the fourth stage—that's from about twelve years of age, I think. That's when children begin to use logic and when they can cope with things that are quite abstract too, like how long something will take to happen. It's interesting, isn't it? But I read that not all psychologists agree with this four-stage theory. There's another argument that children simply perform better in psychological tests as their language and memory improve. So it could just be that the capacity of their memory has got bigger.、Mm, I'd like to find out more about that. But anyway, we've got plenty to write about, haven't we? Yes. That is the end of exercise five, and of the exam.